What's going on, y'all? James Hancock here, here to continue my Dark Souls walkthrough. We are in the final stretch, basically. I mean, I'm going to take down Manus in this video, and then it's on to the final boss of the game. And I've just had an absolute blast from start to finish doing this. It's one of those things where I've got some knowledge now about Dark Souls, so it's just cool to kind of codify it and gather it and put it all in one place, have like a record of it. Because, you know, when I'm a tired old man and I'm talking about my gaming accomplishments to people who have no idea what video games even are, because at that point we'll just project our consciousness into some crazy virtual reality. But I'll say back in the old days when you actually played games, there was this really, really dark, spooky, evil, challenging franchise called Dark Souls. And the first one was really, really memorable. And I put it online to show how it was done. So that's my own little tiny accomplishment but also my first walkthrough so i've just been having a lot of fun learning how to do a walkthrough and hopefully they will be stronger more interesting blah 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 in the future um the reason i am kind of line of sighting these guys in this area is because there is a spellcaster back there who will just absolutely shred you but he's hard to see until you get close i'm just going to charge in and start blasting and i actually got that worked out way better than I thought it would. I had no idea that my homing soul mass would just uh, take out the two bad guys and that my soul spear would take out the main one. I probably shouldn't have called attention to that. I should, but yeah, man, that's exactly how I planned it. But that would not be honest. So anyway, just want to make sure you take that fucker out, and that way you can get that spell. There's a few remaining spells in this zone, one for pyromancy, one for sorcery, although the sorcery one's... Uh, I, I did a little digging, and I don't know if any of these dark spells are faith-based or not, because I think the majority of them are intelligence-based, except for the uh, the pyromancy one, obviously. I, I don't know what the stats are. I don't even bother to check, because I never even uh, upgraded my little flame hand thing you use for casting the spells. Now, if you need any humanities at all, this is by far the best place in the game to farm them. I mean, earlier in the game, it was good to farm the rats in uh, the depths, these guys are basically walking humanities, and they will beat the hell out of you if you get within melee range, especially if they gang up on you. They just suck the life right out of you. However, you can farm humanities like a beast from them, which I will show later on, because I farm 30 humanities or enough humanities. Oh, that is a little clue about where we want to go. Um, but I farm enough humanities to max out yet another uh, covenant that requires humanities as a turn-in. So you shall see, but yeah, Homing Crystal Soul Mass pretty much one-shots all these guys. They come in various shapes and sizes, some small, some big. Obviously, the bigger ones do more damage. You don't want to let them get close to you, but I'm having no trouble taking them down with my spells, which is nice. This area is not real big, but there are a couple different options on the direction and route that you go, but I'm going to explore every square inch of it, pick up every piece of gear, and then take on Manus and I really like the idea of man. He's like this crazy, evil, demonic figure whose realm is kind of slowly expanding and taking over, uh, you know, our world. And we essentially got to carve this cancer out before it spreads any further. I also really like the idea of going back in time and participating in kind of the legends and history of the Dark Souls lore, of which we're about to see a taste of it right here. This is where Sif, the big doggy that we fought way, way, way in the future, this is where he finally was, uh, like basically had put up a, a protective force field, was erected around him by Artorius, because Artorius knew that um, things weren't going well for them. So here is baby Sif, and this is why many, many years later, Sif is so protective of Artorius' sword and everything. He's very loyal to his master. But what's cool is that by, I don't really know if we're like freeing his soul or what, but this will allow us to summon Sif in the fight against Manus, which I just think is cool as hell. Anytime you can summon a giant wolf with a kick-ass two-handed sword in its mouth to, to help you in a fight, that is a, uh, a buddy worth having. Cleansing great shield, very powerful shield, but I will never have enough strength on this character to properly wield a great shield, so I don't even bother checking stats. I'm sure it has something for resisting poison or curses or something like that, but... That is not how I allotted my stats. Now, there is a shortcut off to the right that I can take, but I'm going to clean up a little bit more of this zone before I take it. Down here, I believe, is the Dark Pyromancy spell, but we shall see. The key is with these guys, just stroll casually. Don't kind of run into things because it's not in your interest to let them get up on you. So, yeah, just let them come to you, take them out, and 
you know, all will be well. And you'll just get humanities up the wazoo for your trouble. Um, yeah, I just also like it. Anytime in a game where late in the game you're introduced to mobs that look totally different from existing mobs, I can't stand it when they just change the color and give them more health. I'm like, hey, it's a new mob. It's like, no, that's just the same mob. You just changed the color and gave them more health. That's boring. Uh, you know, that's like old school 80s shit. I like it when you get some new content and new bad guys to fight. So yeah, even these guys aren't super imaginative. I just like the idea that you've been seeing humanities the entire game, and now all of a sudden you're exposed to essentially like walking humanities. I don't know anything about the lore of these creatures. I don't even know their names, but the fact that they drop humanities hand over fist, that's for me all I need to know. All right, so that's the Black Flame Pyromancy. If you're a Pyromancer, you definitely want to snag that spell if you're planning on grabbing all the spells that in the game, which is always fun. If you're a Sorcerer or a Pyromancer or a Faith Build, part of the fun is just collecting all the spells. What's weird is that Dark Souls, I don't know if they do this on purpose or not, but they don't really try to have any balance whatsoever in terms of which spells are useful or which spells are totally not useful. I saw this hysterical video about Dark Souls 3 making fun of all the faith spells and basically trying to figure out a way to put them to use. And it's incredible how you'll have like 50 spells to choose from and you'll end up using like two your, your entire playthrough. I mean, granted, I've used my light spell and I've used my remedy spell and I've like kind of deliberately tried to have some variety. But the majority of spells in Dark Souls you'll just never use. I remember playing in Dark Souls 2. I was real into my pyromancy and I was real into collecting all the variety. All right, that's the shortcut that came up. Um, it brings you basically back to the fire, uh, the bonfire by the Ulaship Township. Oh, Ulaship, I keep saying that. Ulasil Township. Which means I've got easy access now to and from Manus' zone. But yeah, when I was playing on um, Dark Souls 2, I remember when I got to the DLC, I was all excited because I had these like crazy like sideways flame attacks and like you know just all these different variety. But in the end, you just need to be able to throw fireballs at people. Like you don't need a whole bunch of variety. I mean, I guess you can use like the flame swath, which is like a little like ticking time bomb you throw out there and it explodes. But in the end, this is an action RPG, not a real RPG. In a real RPG, a tabletop RPG, you want hundreds and hundreds of spells. Right, that's the gaping flaw of that spell is that if you walk by walls, they just disappear. So you want to be conscious of that and stay away from walls when you got it up. Otherwise, you're just wasting the spell. So, yeah, you run down here. But rather than going all the way down, you take this little path up, which leads us back to the main area. There is a small kind of sort of trap, but I will show it to you. But yeah, in tabletop RPGs, granted, you might, if you're a magic user, mage, whatever you want to call them, you might just whip out a bunch of mag uh, magic missiles and lightning bolts and everything, but it is cool just opening up like the player's handbook and seeing hundreds of spells to choose from because there will come a time in a story or in role-playing where it's just cool to have these really, really obscure, weird spells with strange... Uh, strange outcomes it just kind of expands the immersiveness of the environment so this looks like a whole bunch of bad guys but it's actually not that many I mean, i've got more than enough spells to just rip right through them but once again you just don't want to rush up there because they will mop the floor with you but if you slowly approach they'll come one two three at a time making them very easy now, as you can see when i'm close hitting him he's draining my health but he's a small one so i'm not that worried about it I'm not a big fan of doing that with the big ones because they will just drain you dry. God damn, I love it when that uh, soul mass spell separates and hits multiple targets and killing them. That's, uh, that's how it's supposed to work. Sometimes all five of them want to shoot a little small one and then it's less cool. But yeah, I've been having some luck with it. Now yeah, all these little glowy dots, more than, more than likely all of them are humanity. So I'm just racking up humanities. Yeah. Which is awesome because, I mean, you really have to kind of save them and preserve them as you're playing if you plan on doing the shortcut. If you're not planning on doing the shortcut in Isolith, you can just use your humanities to kindle every bonfire or just stay human so you can do summons and all that good stuff. But if you're planning on maxing out the um, Chaos Servant Covenant and the Dark Wraiths Covenant, I mean, that's 60 humanities you're going to need to spend just on two covenants. So that's a fuck ton. So you definitely don't want to waste your humanities during your playthrough. And I'm definitely planning on maxing out the Dark Raids, as you will see later in this video. So down here is just uh, it's an item that's totally not worth going for, but I go for it anyway because I'm trying to grab everything. And it's another uh, carving. Help me.
which is you know useful to have if you're planning on playing a game for a very very long time but at this point in the game there's only like two things left to do you got to fight Manus and you got to fight Gwen so having a help me carving is kind of silly but I guess you could use it on New Game Plus but I'm just yeah I guess they came up with the idea of the carvings for the DLC this is me being totally retarded I was trying to do a plunge attack on that guy and just missed and died yeah, I might be one-shotting bosses in the DLC, but I still die to stupid stuff like gravity. What am I doing? Am I, why am I messing with all my items so much? Uh, I think I was just equipping Homer Bone, because I am going to need Homer Bone here in a bit before I take on Manus. So now I'm going to go back, get my souls, finish the uh, the my full clear of the environment, then I'll Homer Bone back. Get my spells, get my flasks, and then take on Manus. It's real easy to just run straight to Manus without having to fight one mob. You don't even have to pause outside the door to summon Sif, because Sif is a weird situation where you can only um, summon Sif inside the actual battle. It's kind of complicated, but I will show you how to look for the mark. I'm fast-forwarding through this because you've already seen me do it. I'm just going the exact same path that I went before in order to get my souls back. Which is, you know, annoying, but whatever. It wouldn't be Dark Souls without the occasional death to gravity. That is what makes these videos worth watching. I mean, Jumpin' Productions, his videos, <laughs> I wouldn't watch them if he didn't have so many deaths to gravity because he records live as he's playing, and he'll be playing all talking about something like politics or healthcare or anything. He'll just be totally rambling about some random topic, and then he'll just shriek and scream in horror as he falls off something, so... Yeah, I think even he recognizes that people watch his channel solely for gravity deaths. Well, not solely. He's obviously a very knowledgeable, very skillful player. But it is funny hearing his caterwauling. So I'm back on familiar territory. This is the area where I found the, um, the Dark Pyromancy spell. So I probably could have done my playthrough of this environment a little more efficiently by not coming down here the way that I did since I had to come back here anyway. But in the DLC, because I tend to just play the DLC once through and then move on, I just don't have it quite as memorized as efficiently as some of the other zones. So, anyway, more free humanities. And, yeah, they dropped twin humanities. And that is just insane. So, yeah. And that's another thing. If you want to use humanities for the farming of items, like say you want to get Titanite Chunks, which I need Titanite Chunks, but I'm just not going to stop to get them. You can farm the hell out of them in the New Londa Ruins fighting those like Dark Wraith, uh, kind of like heavily armored guys. They drop Titanite Chunks like a beast, but what you really want to do is eat 10 humanities and then put on your gold ring. Um, what is it called? The, the gold serpent. Yeah, gold serpent ring which increases drop rate. And when you've got 10 humanities on your character, the drop rate from uh, mobs goes up dramatically. And you could go farm anything you want. Or say I wanted to max out the Darkmoon Blade and I wanted to go fight those bird creatures back in the uh, Painted World of Ariamis. That would be another thing to do. So yeah, once you have access to this zone, it's farm city if you wish to. But once again, with a game that's as out of date as this, I just don't see the need and farming anything that I don't need just for the sake of finishing my character and clearing the game. If this were a brand new game, it would be absolutely worth farming each and every single thing just because, you know, it's just you're going to be spending a lot of time playing through over and over and over again on the same character and doing a lot of shit, which is what I'm looking forward to doing in Dark Souls 3. So White Titanite Slab, that is huge if you're planning on maxing out an occult weapon or a divine weapon. There's your white titan. There's a, I guess that's the second one because we found one right before uh, Nito as well. So, yeah, I think, I believe there's slabs, two slabs for every kind of upgrade you might want to do. And there's titanite slabs and there's the red titanite slabs and there's the blue titanite slabs. And I think I've found at this point all of them. Although there's still, the, I think some of them have a chance of just dropping off people. So, there is the gate to Manus, which is, you know, I'm not going to go through it quite yet because there's a piece of gear here, but I want to demonstrate where you go to cheese the boss. If you say you want to come through here at level 50 for whatever reason, and you just want to kill everything, but you're just worried about uh, not being able to fight Manus due to being underpowered, I'm going to show you a way to kill him with arrows without even engaging him. Uh, so you go up to this ledge over here. You're going to look down. What's weird is you cannot 
put go into target mode and lower your angle low enough to hit them. You have to eyeball it. So what you want to do is put on your bow, kind of loosely target, but he's way lower than that. That's as low as I can take it. And then you kind of manually go lower. But the way you know you're hitting him is you got to basically shoot into the darkness toward his eyes a little above. And when you see a little blue spark, that's when you know you're actually making contact. And it takes a ton of arrows to, to kill this guy. But there are videos where you see people do it. It's just, I mean, you, again, it's Dark Souls 1, not Dark Souls 3. So if you want to come down here with 999 arrows, you can. I'm pretty sure it's immune to poison. So, yep, I think I'm seeing the blue spark now. Let's see. Yep, there it is. There's the blue spark. So I'm hitting him. So that is the angle. If I wanted to just sit here and shoot, 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 I could get him weak and then go down there and make the fight easier if you just run out of patience. But I'm now going to go back and get all my spells, get my humanity back, because I want to fight him with the help of Sif, because I love doggies, and I think it's cool to team up with doggies. And yeah, at this point, I've got so many humanities. Why not restore my humanity before a boss fight? I mean, I've just got humanity to spare. I'm also going to pass uh, one more level before going in there. So now I've got Vitality 40. That's as high as I'm going to take it. I, there's no reason to take Vitality past 40. It's basically as a soft cap. But I've got crap loads of health now for enough to uh, handle any boss in the game. So again, there are only two left. There's Manus and there's Gwen. But in New Game Plus, you'll definitely find that the challenge is definitely very real new game plus in dark souls starts out really really easy because you begin the, you go to the beginning of the game with all your gear all your spells all your everything and you're just mopping the floor with everything but then it starts to become a challenge and that's because of the soft cap on various stats in terms of the benefits you get from them leveling up a ton is not necessarily going to help you power through new game plus or new game plus plus i mean the people that do new game plus seven those people are just fucking insane <laughs> i don't know how they do that shit anyway so this is the great fight with manis you go into his home i, I love the the drama of this little cutscene or cinematic i think it's super duper cool and as you can tell that's the same hand that pulled me through the portal uh, to begin the additional content or DLC. So clearly Manus recognizes that uh, we're a threat and need to be dispensed with. So yeah, I mean, he's weird. Like, he's not necessarily the most interesting looking boss, but it kind of works for me. He's just total chaos and anarchy. And he's got this big, giant, like, fucking disgusting arm. And he's got a smaller arm. I just love the fact that he is just so mad looking. And that giant staff that he's wielding, we will be able to make after we beat him. So... As always, when I'm fighting a boss for the first time in a while, he hits me a hell of a lot as I'm learning his moveset again. I'm summoning Sif, that's the symbol. So when you appear, don't go wandering around. because It's a big area, and you'll forget where the summon sign is. Only downside of Sif as well. Sif's got a ton of health and does decent damage. Sif's not super aggressive and not super good at getting the attention of the boss. Like, Manix, as you'll see doesn't really take that much of an interest in fighting Sif, so I don't get that many breaks. And anytime I hit him with a big spell, he immediately gets pissed at me again. Man, man is father of the abyss. He's just, uh, he is a, a boss that is worthy of being a Dark Souls final boss because uh, you, know, you, you want a cool zone and a cool challenge to kind of bring things to a close. I'm glad that he uh, definitely doesn't disappoint. And there's some people who think he's the hardest boss in the game. I don't know who the hardest boss in Dark Souls 1 is. Um, I mean, was there any boss that I died to more than once? I can't even remember. But, yeah, I don't know which one I find to be the most challenging. There are not that many bosses that are insanely difficult. But granted, this is my officially my third time clearing the game at this point. So I just have had a, a lot of practice. The first time I fought Manus uh, on my first complete playthrough, I definitely died a few times. Um. I don't know why, but because I, I think I was like at level 110. I should have been able to mop the floor with them. But as you can tell, my spells are hitting them hard. That spell right there, which almost killed me, that's when you want to use the silver pendant. I was kind of recovering and not even thinking, so I didn't have a chance to use it. But when he gets ready to cast that, if you put on the silver pendant and put up your four field and you start spamming, 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 you'll be totally fine. And yeah, my soul spirits are just wrecking him. He's wrecking me with that big ass weapon of his, which is an attack I will gain with the staff that I'm gonna make. But um, 
it, the, there's a drawback though to using his staff is that it jacks up the power of your spells but halves the number of uses. So I got the Soul of Manus. This is the girl who I met in the future who sold me some of my early sorcery spells. I keep trying to talk to her because I, I looked this up after the fact. I forgot that you can talk to her here and she just kind of moans, but basically she is free now. And if I go back to the Dark Root Basin, and I can now summon her again. During the DLC, you're unable to summon her until you free her from mana. So that's a, a cool little subplot. But not super relevant or necessary or whatever. Actually, I might go talk to her. Actually, I'll, I'll look it up and see if she's worth talking to. I think all it is is that she just becomes available again, but I'll confirm that before I record the next video. So yeah, light the bonfire, level up. So yeah, I'm going to level 97, which means I will not reach level 100 before the end of the game, which has me very, very sad. But there's just, I would have to go farm to get enough um, souls. I would have to farm like 170,000 souls to get to level 100, and that would just take forever. I no, but farming 170,000 souls when you don't have bosses to fight. I guess I could camp out outside of um, certain boss fights and allow myself to be summoned. I just don't think there are enough players that would be needing help or wanting help that it would um, be worth it. The reason I'm standing here right now is I am on the internet looking her up, trying to see what the hell's going on. Because I didn't want to leave the zone without doing something that needed to be done. And uh, yeah, so just be patient with me. Oh, and that's to, while I'm waiting for this, I can talk a little bit about something that's online right now, which I absolutely love. If you are a Marvel fan, you're probably aware of the film Thor Ragnarok, which is coming out in the fall of next year, and it's being directed by this great director named Taika Waititi, who I believe is from New Zealand. He's an Australian or from New Zealand, but he made that excellent mockumentary, uh, What We Do in the Shadows, which a, do a fake documentary about uh, kind of domesticated vampires and what they do in their spare time. It was absolutely hysterical and super low budget movie and he did a really great Kickstarter campaign to raise money to distribute it and it just it found a, a nice big audience. I, I was really, really happy to see that he enjoyed some success with it. And he is doing Thor Ragnarok but he decided for Comic Con to do a fake documentary about what Thor was doing during Captain America's Civil War and they finally posted it online over the weekend. And I've seen it three times now. It is absolutely hysterical. I think one of the overlooked opportunities that Marvel has uh, kind of like failed to exploit to, at, at this point is just how funny Chris Hemsworth can be as Thor. I mean, we get a little taste of it in the Joss Whedon movies, like when in the first Avengers movie when he makes the line, says the line about Loki being adopted. And then there's a funny bit in Avengers Age, Age of Ultron when he's talking about how people need to be careful about the Scarlet Witch because of, uh, you know, they're mortal, but like Thor, but I am mighty. And as he's saying that, you can tell he's already tripping balls and totally inside of this illusion she's created in his head. And it's, yeah, it's, it's funny stuff, but I hope Taika Waititi will incorporate more of that without, you know, sacrificing the dramatic power of the story. But Thor Ragnarok, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's Hela. He's teaming up with uh, Hulk. He's fighting Surtur. He's fighting, I mean, it's, it sounds like they're going the full, hardcore, mythological route. I just love the idea of the movie having both comedy as well as insanely overpowered people. I mean, when you've got gods and demons and giants, it's kind of weird for Hawkeye to show up with his bow and arrow. All right, this is me. I'm just going into Ander Orlando briefly in order to experiment with some of the spells. Dark Orb is really, really powerful, but I'm having a hard time saying locked on to these guys because of the darkness, so I keep <laughs> missing. But anyway, it's powerful, but slow, so uh, I just wanted to mess with it a bit. And yeah, Dark Bead, it goes wide, but you can tell that's also very powerful. Dark Fog is basically like a giant like hand grenade, and you don't get that many of them. But uh, I just wanted to experiment with everything before bringing this playthrough through a close. White Dragon Breath only works if you stay targeted. But it's a pretty cool spell, and it works pretty much the same in Dark Souls 3. But, god damn, I keep missing. I'm just missing with all these spells. I'm just not having a lot of luck. There it is, boom. That's White Dragon Breath. So, you know, it's a, it's a PvP spell, I think, for the most part. But I just didn't want to finish my playthrough without experimenting with everything. Now, I, one of my goals was to get every single spell in the game during this playthrough, but I had a choice to make. I mean, that spell just hit like a truck. 
Um, with the soul that I just got from Manus, I have two options. I can go to the giant blacksmith here in Anorlando and make the uh, Manus staff or the Manus catalyst, which is really, really powerful. Make it like I said, it takes away half your spells but makes your spells more powerful. I want, I want to try using it on Gwen just to see how hard it hits. And then, or you can take the... Um, the soul to the crow's nest and you can drop it off and he will give you a spell and the spell is basically the same as crystal soul mass but it's the dark version of it so if i played through again on new game plus obviously when i kill manis in new game plus then i'd be able to turn in his soul and then i have all the spells so that is an achievement i will not be getting because i opted for making this the uh, the staff instead just because it's like a giant melee weapon that i will be able to use i have high enough strength to swing it and I just want to see how powerful my spells can get when I've got the Dusk Crown on and the Staff of Manus. So sorry about that, but it, once again, Dark Souls is a game about choices and decisions and sacrifices. And if you make certain decisions, it is at the expense of other paths you might go. So the way you make boss weapons, you just go to this guy, see what he can make. He can turn the Sorcerer's Catalyst into the Manus Catalyst if you have the Soul of Manus, and it takes 5,000 souls. Um, another thing I need to check between now and the next video is whether or not I can upgrade the Staff of Man. This was something I totally forgot to do. Because I've been gathering those uh, Demon Titanites the entire playthrough without spending any of them. I could probably use them to jack up that catalyst. So I will be figuring that out before I begin the recording of my next. Anyway, this is the Staff. I don't really like the way it looks. It's basically like a big giant like bone axe. But, boom. If you do the power attack, it swings hard so it just gives you an option for if you are out of spells you can still hit people in the face and yeah, the magic adjustment compared to the other catalysts is way higher it's definitely the most powerful staff as long as you don't mind losing the number of uses on your spells so the only thing i really have left to do now is i want to go rejoin the dark wraiths because the dark race is the the group that i decided to join a while back which kind of locked me into doing the evil ending for dark souls and I'm also going to turn in a whole bunch of humanities and max out this covenant and get my, uh, get the, the, um, like the dark set. It's a, a sword and pseudo armor that looks totally bad. It's, it basically makes you look like the dark wraiths that you fight in the new Londo ruins. So if you want to do some epic evil cosplay and look like Skeletor, that's how you do it. The only problem is, as you saw when I did the Chaos Servant Covenant, you need to um, eat all the humanities first, which is time consuming, and then you also need to turn them all in, and you have to do it one at a time. You know, Dark Souls 3, if you want to turn in 30 of whatever to a covenant, you can just click however many you want to turn in, and boom, you're done. Uh, the reason I'm stationary here right now is because I was just really quick checking the internet to see how many humanities I would need to get the dark set, just because I've never gotten it before in any of my Dark Souls playthrough. And so once I realized what was involved, then I just resigned myself to doing this loathsome task. So I'm just going to fast forward through it because even on, I mean, this is quadruple fast forward. Even on quadruple fast forward, it's pretty slow and pretty boring. So back to the Thor, Taika Waititi thing. But what I loved about the fake documentary is it shows a lot of really, really weird, interesting kind of like Norse mythology details that you wouldn't expect, but it gives me really high hopes for the movie. At one point, Chris Hemsworth makes this joke about this meat he's been cooking in the sun for a couple weeks, and he shows this like pile of like festering, rotting meat with like flies going around. He's like, "It's gonna be delicious," or something like that. And I have a feeling this must have been some weird way that uh, you know people from Sweden or Finland used to prepare their meat way back when. And he also has a sign on his door for his roommate, keep out Daryl, but it's written in this incredibly old-fashioned language and everything. So the fact that Taika Waititi already is incorporating weird little details like that, I have a feeling the mythological elements of Thor Ragnarok are going to be way more compelling and way more interesting than they have been in Thor 1 and Thor 2. I mean, Thor 1 and Thor 2, they were fine. They were okay. They're not my favorite Marvel movies by any stretch of the imagination, but they worked and served their purpose of introducing the characters but I'm ready for them to go down the rabbit hole of like genuine Norse mythology strangeness. And I have a feeling Taika Waititi is just the guy to do it. Uh, but the other great bit was in, he sits down with Mark Ruffalo, who's in Bruce Banner mode, and he's basically like asking, like, how come 
you know, no one's contacted it. Right, there's the gear, the dark gauntlets, dark armor, dark sword, all that stuff. So I'm going to pop that stuff on real quick, just do a little dress up. But Mark Ruffalo's laughing about how he hates wearing cutoffs or doesn't wear cutoffs, but every, he all the time is waking up wearing cutoffs, which I thought was just hysterical because, as we all know, like when Hulk turns into Hulk, for whatever reason, his clothes just don't explode off him like they should. He's always allowed to keep his, his cutoffs on <laughs> because obviously no one wants to look at a naked Hulk running around. But the reality is Hulk, as big as he is, like, you know, when Lou Ferrigno was Hulk, it made sense for the pants just to turn into cutoffs. But Hulk in the movies is, like, the size of a tank. So, obviously, his underwear and jeans would go bye-bye, but I thought that was great. And then um, Thor's telling him, to like, how Iron Man can get a hold of him. He's like, he's like oh, I don't have a phone. Like, tell him to send a raven. And I just, I loved it. So, I think Chris Hemsworth, he's underutilized in terms of his comedic chops. These are the sw the, the move set of the sword. It's just like the Dark Raids down in New Londo. So yeah, awesome, awesome armor set. Looks cool as hell. If I had really, really high strength, I would totally wear it because with the armor, as you can tell that slow roll or fat roll, the armor and the sword are both insanely heavy. So you're only gonna whip them out if you are uh, a beastly, like kind of like heavy armor, heavy melee, melee dude of which I'm the a total, complete, exact opposite. So now I'm going to put on my regular gear and get ready for the final confrontation because uh, there's nothing left to do. I mean, I, I, I'm going to try and upgrade my staff, and I want to kill Gwen. That's it. So, yeah, it's, uh, sadly, this game is drawing to a close, and who knows the next time I'll play Dark Souls all the way through. I don't know. I mean, who knows? Maybe I never will. Maybe just cool games will keep coming out. I like to believe that I might come back whenever and do one last playthrough. But I've played through his faith. I've played through his sorcery. I've played through his decks. The only thing remaining to do is play through his strength. And I don't know if there's enough left to explore in the game to justify playing through for a fourth time, essentially what is now a dead game, um, just to see what the strength build is like. I'll probably just do the strength build in Dark Souls 3 and uh, you know, call it a night. So now it is time to go to the altar, turn in the souls. Another option would be I could have just gone back to Firelink Shrine and rolled down through the pit in here, but I just thought it was cooler to go through my Covenant leader to do it since I decided to form an alliance with that guy. But yeah, you turn in all the souls of all the bosses, and the door opens. And it's a short zone. You fight four or five kind of like badass knights who drop some pretty cool stuff, and it's a great place to farm, farm mats. Maybe there's one item in there? And there's a place to summon Solar if his questline didn't get glitched out. Then there's the boss, and that'll be it. So, anyway, thank you so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. If so, please subscribe and like and all that good stuff. And give me a shout on Twitter at Colbrax. But thanks so much for watching, and I will be back at y'all soon. So long.